come to worship God one more again. If you don't have a book, you care for a handout. I do have a handout. Uh, we are experiencing God day number three. And we are on page 18 in the orange book. And I'm not sure what page it is in the blue, green, black book. Page 18, at the bottom of the page, you will find 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. When we left on last time, we were discussing the fact that we are moldable. We are moldable. We have to be moldable. In other words, God is the potter, we are the clay. And God being the potter and we are being the clay, we ought to be moldable. God has the ability, he has the sovereign will to mold us any way he chooses. That's why we are shaped the way we are. That's why we, we are the color we are. That's why we are the nationality, nationality we are. Because God has the privilege of doing whatever God wants to do with his clay. Amen. We are clay. We are dust of the ground. God has shaped us just the way he wants us to be. So be proud of what God has done in your life and what he's doing to you. So, and then we, we understand that we are God's servants. And as we are God's servants, we serve God the way God would have us to serve him. Yes? If you look on the left side of your page, to be God's servant, servant, you must be moldable and you must remain in the hands of God. You must remain in the hand of the master. You must remain in the hands of the potter. You are his clay. He has the right to do what he wants to do with his clay. He is the sovereign God. He is able to do whatever he wants to do with his clay. Aren't you glad you are God's clay? Yes. Aren't you God, glad that God has shaped you just like, and I'm not just talking about the shape you're in, whether you're a size two or size zero. I'm not talking about that shape. I'm talking about the shape that God has put you in in your spiritual man and spiritual woman. God has shaped you just the way he wants you to be. It is up to you to increase your faith in him. So Paul says in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What that means is the more you hear the word, the more your faith grows. The more you dive into the word, the more your faith increases. The more you trust God, the more God is able to develop you as God has already put you together. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? I'm so glad that God has molded us. I'm so glad that God has shaped us. He has put us together. And it becomes our responsibility to stay in God's hands. What do I mean when I say stay in God's hands? What is that? What is that? What am I talking about? You got to stay in the hands of the potter. What am I talking about? Stay in the potter's hands. Yes? No? Maybe so. What am I talking about? Stay in the potter's hands. Stay in the potter's hands. Keep your focus on God. You can't just leave God out of things that you're doing. You have to always include God. Can you use the mic? The one that's sitting next to you. You have to always um, uh, include God in your plans. You don't leave God out. Okay. God has the right to change our plans, and God has the right to make our plans. One guy says ego means edging God out. Ego. E-G-O means that you are edging God out. I mean, you got, you got your own life going, you're doing what you want to do with your own life, and you just push God aside. But when we stay in the master's hands, stay in God's hands, guess what? God is able to continue to hold us. And God can do more with us than we can do with ourselves. Isn't that something? Okay, today we are looking at 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, and Sister Whitlock is going to come, and she's going to take several verses here, and she's going to read 1 Kings. When you read scripture, will you please stand? You can read the, the commentary sitting, but if you read scripture, please stand so we can know that we are honoring God. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 18, and she's going to give us the verses that she's going to read. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. 
15 through 39. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will soon reign on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. Fifteen. Then Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the vows. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you live falter between two opinions? The Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am I left of the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophet are 450 men. Therefore let them give us two bowls, and let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it into pieces, and lay it up in the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you can call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it and called it on the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar, which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey. Perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. When the midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came to me, came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then the stones that he built, an altar to the name of the Lord, he made a trench around the large foot around the altar large enough to hold two sails of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it in the wood and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it two second time and this sec and they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time and they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel, and I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O God, hear me. Hear me, O, hear me, o Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord of God, and that you have turned your hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it lifted up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Amen. 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 This is one of my favorite uh, passages of Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. Because you find Elijah, Elijah, and one of the first questions is how many people? Elijah is standing on Mount Carmel, 
And as he stood on Mount Carmel, he was standing against how many people? 850 prophets, right? 850 prophets. He stood before 850 prophets. Were these prophets in support of him? They were against him. They were in opposition. They opposed him. What was the conversation here? What were they to prove? God is real. Right. Which God is the real and the true living God, right? Mm -hmm. So here it is. You have 850, not just lay people, 850 prophets. You got the prophets of Baal, then you got the prophets of Jezebel. I say you got the prophets of Baal, mm -hmm. and you got the prophets of Jezebel. Ahaz, well, Ahab was the king, and he was married to a woman called Jezebel. Now, I know and you know that you're not going to name your children Jezebel. Sister Welcome, why you didn't name your daughter Jezebel? Are you kidding? No. <laughs> why not? And curse her like that. And curse her like, what's wrong with Jezebel? Y'all do know there are some people named Jezebel, right? Why didn't you name your children Jezebel? It has a nice ring to the name. What it connotates. Okay, so what does it connotate? That she's bad. That she's bad? She was just a... She was slutty? She used her body to entice and hypnotize him. We talking about the same person? Jezebel, yes. Jezebel, the wife of the king? Evil. Evil, that's one good word for Jezebel. So Jezebel was a problem for her husband. What it suggests to the 21st century women is that you can cause a problem for your husband. If you carry yourself the wrong way, you can cause a problem for your husband. Somebody said, I wish she was here tonight. <laughs> you can cause a problem for your husband. And check this out, men. You can cause a problem for your wife. Right. You can cause a problem for your significant other. How you carry yourself, how you speak, what God you've chosen to follow can be problematic. Jezebel had prophets and they worshiped the prophet Baal. And as they worshiped the prophet Baal, that, that kingdom was, was called far away from God. When the righteous is in power, the people rejoice. But when the wicked is in power, the people suffer. When the righteous is in power, the people rejoice. People are satisfied. People are loving the Lord. The Lord is being glorified. But when you have a God named Baal, an idol God, any God that's not the true and the living God is a problem for you. So here it is, 1 Kings chapter 18, we find Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. And as they're there, you have the prophets of the grove, it's what, it's what it says in the King James, the prophet of the grove and the prophet of Baal, which, is the prof, which are the prophets of Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. Elijah gives them an opportunity. The contest is to prove who is the true and the living God. The prophets of the grove, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Jezebel goes first. Go first. They called on Baal from morning to noon. They called on Baal from morning to noon. Did Baal answer? No. Why Baal didn't answer? He was God. He was the true and the living God. They called on him from morning to noon, and as they called on him from morning to noon, 
Elijah began to talk to him. You know, I, I grew up in an era where football was football, basketball was basketball, baseball was baseball, and you could say what you wanted. You get on your opponent's nerve. Yeah. Now they throw flags and give you texts for saying something to your opponent. Isn't that something? I remember playing baseball, and I would be yelling from, from, from right field, oh, he couldn't hit the side of the ball. <laughs> throw it right down the field. Oh, boy, get him up, get him up, put him out, man. Throw it hard, put it down the pipe, and when you put it down the pipe, he couldn't hit it. Come on, man. As I spit my sunflower seeds out of our field. We could talk that trash. You can't talk trash now. You could dump on somebody and stand over them. You do it now, you get a tip. You could, you could hear a person before they get to the end zone and say, you can't get in the end zone on me. You can't do that now. You could dance in the end zone. You can't do that now. What I'm saying to you, Elijah was on Mount Carmel, and as he was on Mount Carmel, he was calling them out. He said, what, what was one of the things he said, Sister Willow? You know he's a God. Why don't you call him a little louder? Maybe your God is meditating. Now let me ask you a question. If your God is in meditation, is he really a God? How many of you think God meditates? How many of you think God has to wonder about what to do next? Elijah begins to taunt them and say to them, Go and call on your God a little louder. Go and call on your God a little longer. He gets so taunting in this thing, he says, maybe your God is gone on a long journey. Call him louder so he can hear you. The God we serve, he is omniscient. He knows everything. He sees everything. Matter of fact, he sees everything before it even takes place. He's God. Elijah began to say, look, y'all going on to, they got so frustrated until they started cutting themselves with stones. That was a symbol of agony. That was a symbol that their God wasn't going to answer. They were disappointed in their God. The God we serve, we can't be disappointed with him because he keeps waking us up. He keeps laying us down. He keeps getting us up. He keeps us in our right mind. They were so disappointed in their God and so angry that they had chosen that God, they started cutting themselves with stone. They put, they put the, the bull on the bullock. They put it on the altar. And he says, don't put any fire on it because the God that you serve is going to answer by fire and he's going to put smoke on this bull. Their God didn't answer by fire. When it became Elijah's time, he says, go bring water, four buckets of water. Pour it on the bull. Pour it on the bull. Pour it on the altar. Go get four more. Pour it on there. Go get four more. Pour it on there. And what he did said, pour it even in the trenches around the altar. And he says, I am confident that the God I serve will answer by fire. Now you know and I know that it's hard to get a fire to burn when water's around. The Bible says he called on God and when he called on God, God answered by fire. He burned up the bullet. He burned up the sacrifice. He burned up the altar. And that fire licked the water out the trenches. That's something to shout about, I tell you. <laughs> the fire licked the water out of the trenches. He's God. Amen. He's God. And he is the only living and only true God. He's God. Who wouldn't serve God like that? Back home, they would say, I wouldn't have religion. How many of y'all know what religion is? 
I wouldn't have a legion that I couldn't feel sometimes. I wouldn't have a God that couldn't show up in my behalf sometimes. God shows up. Some even say when God shows up, he shows out. But the fact of the matter is God doesn't have to show out because he's God. He already is awesome. He's amazing. He's God. Yes? He's God. So let's look at the question. Elijah was God's servant. How many false prophets did he face on Mount Carmel? 850, right? 850. He faced 850 prophets on Mount Carmel. B. What test did Elijah purpose to prove whose God was the true God? That he would answer by fire, right? The true God would answer by fire. Let me tell you. They were dumb to let Elijah pull them into this thing. They should have known that their God was not the true and the living God. The reason why, have you wondered, and you may not have read previously to this, have you wondered why they call Elijah one who troubled Israel? The reason why they call Elijah the one who troubled Israel because Elijah had gone to Ahab and he said to Ahab, it's not going to rain, it's going to be a drought, it's not going to rain until I say so. And guess what? It didn't rain until Elijah said so. Don't focus on Elijah, focus on the God that he serves. Not only did they call him the the, the one who troubled Israel because he prophesied no rain, but because there was a drought. It didn't rain for three and a half years. There was a drought. What happens in a drought for farmers? They lose their crops. Stuff died. The cattle died. The, 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 the cows died. The horses died. The vegetation and the food dries up. So they deem him as the one who troubled Israel. Said it's not going to rain until I say rain. That's amazing. It wasn't because Elijah was, was one who was bragging on himself, but he was bragging on his God. How many prophets today we know that don't brag on God, but they brag on themselves? Even the radio broadcaster. Oh, come to the Coliseum. He's going to be walking the floor like never before. He's going to be laying hands and raising the dead and healing the sick like never before. He's special. He is different. He's anointed of God. And every broadcast is about who he is and not about who God is. We got to lift up Jesus, lift up God. When we talk about who God is, we brag about him. Do I have to be hollering at you right now? No, but I'm talking about who God is. Can you hear me in this voice? Yes, yeah. but I'm talking about who God is. We ought to get excited when we're talking about who God is. Elijah says, go on and call on your God. Your God ain't going to answer you is what he was saying. Then he had the nerve to say, your God may be sleep. He tired of making house calls. What do you think about this, Mr. Brown? He said, go and call on him. Your God may be sleep. Wake him up. Call him a little louder so he can wake up. <laughs> on Mount Carmel. I mean, he's just feeling himself. On Mount Carmel. I mean, he, he said, go and call him. And then... The Bible says when he began to call on God, God, not only did he answer by fire, he burned up everything around. And when he burned up stuff, the people who did not trust God, the text says that they began to worship the true and the living God. Let me just say to you, when God does great miracles in your life, it is one that miracle after the other. It is one that calls other people to acknowledge him. But you got to do it for God's sake, not for your sake. Isn't that something? It's all about God. 
Okay, um, top of page number 19. Who's reading? Elijah was outnumbered 850 to 1. If God had not uh, displayed his power by coming in fire and assuming the sacrifice and altar, and Elijah was proposed, Elijah would have uttered, utterly failed. That would have cost him his life. Uh, Elijah pre prepared the altar of the Lord. He had remained where God assigned him and did everything God commanded him. This was God's plan, not his. He sent. He went where God guided him. Where God, when God told him and did what God instructed him. Then God accomplished the purpose through him. God wanted the people to recognize the Lord as the true God, as God worked through his prophet, Elijah. This is exactly what happened. Amen. Amen. Look, look at what it says. Now, I'm being outnumbered, and I'm outnumbered not two to one. I'm outnumbered 850 to one. That was enough to make most of us run. Just to show all, just to see all those folks show up and I'm by myself. Later on, you will find out that Elijah got on the run because of Jezebel. And he tried to tell God, God, I'm the only one left that's going to honor you, God. God said to Elijah, let me tell you something. There are over 7,000 men who have not bowed their knees to me. Do you feel sometimes you're the only one that's willing to live for the Lord, work for the Lord, sacrifice for the Lord? Let me just share with you. There are many who have not bowed to them. There was once a lawyer, a young lawyer, young African-American lawyer, female. She was able to sue one company after the other, one company after the other, and she was greatly successful with her lawsuits, even in the state of Texas, she, she won her cases on behalf of employees. So I called her one day, and she said to me, I don't represent employees anymore. What she said, Brother Miles, is that I represent the companies. So the companies were so sick and tired of her representing their employees until they bought her out. She doesn't represent employees anymore. She represents employers. So she could sit at home all day long and do nothing because the employers just wanted to pull her out of the courtroom. Because she was winning against them. Young girl, she was winning against them. And then no employees wanted to go against her in court because she had this long track record of winning for the sake of employees, and then she had this long track record of winning on the sake, for the sake of employers. Let me tell you, don't sell out. Money is not worth it. Stay with God, and God will show you that he is the true and the living God, and he will do it in such a, a demonstration as he did for Elijah. Burn up the sacrifice, burn up the wood. And the thing I like about it, he licked the water. The fire licked the water up out of the trenches. Ooh, look at God. Who has uh, did Elijah? Did Elijah. I think Brother Taylor has did Elijah. Oh. Did Elijah or God brings down fire from heaven? <laughs> did Elijah or God? Bring down the fire from heaven. God did. What was Elijah doing? Being obedient. Elijah had no ability to perform the miraculous. When God did something, only he could do. 
all the people knew he was the true God. Yes, sir. God convinced people of his power present through his obedient servant. Amen. So the question is, did God do it or did Elijah do it? Elijah did nothing but be obedient. And Brother Taylor says that, that God does his miraculous things and shows forth his miraculous presence through those who are obedient. Do you want God to show forth his power, his miracles through you? Well, you got to be obedient. You got to make the sacrifice. It was a great sacrifice for Elijah to stand against 850 prophets. It was a major sacrifice. But he was being obedient to God. He was working on God's behalf, and he was doing what God said do. Look at look at C on page number 18. What did he intend to prove through his experience? That God Almighty was the true and the living God. What did Elijah plan to prove? He wanted to prove on page 18 D, he wanted to prove that God was the true and living God. What did Elijah do to the altar of the Lord? What did Elijah do to the altar of the Lord? The text says that he rebuilt it. He rebuilt it, he built it, and then check this out. He had them to wear it down. E, how did the people respond? How did the people respond? They bowed down and worshiped God. Which God did they worship? True. The true God. Did they worship Baal? No more Baal worshiping. The people responded by worshiping the true and the living God. What did God? What did God's work do? It convicted the people. What else did it do? What did God's work do? Prove that He was the true God. Prove that He was true God. What else did God's works do? Accomplish His purpose. He accomplished His purpose. And what was his purpose? God wanted to prove to everybody that he's God. The Bible says that God will have no other God before him. Exodus 20 says that he is a jealous God. Somebody said that, well, God has got no reason to be jealous. But the Bible says he's a jealous God. And if he's a jealous God, he will not have any other God before him. If you put another God before our God, God going to deal with you and going to deal with your God. Isn't that something? Does he deserve to do it? He's God. He does what he wants to do. G, what did Elijah's work do? Elijah, you see, God's work showed and proved that he was God. It fulfilled his, his purpose. Now, what did Elijah's work do? Who's talking? He set the stage for it. He set the stage for God to show him himself, reveal himself. And it also shows us that we need to be obedient unto God. Be obedient even in the midst of stuff that doesn't look like you even need to be a part of. Be obedient to it. Page 19. Number 6. Can I say one? Yes. And also show, you know, because of his obedience, what God will do. Because of his obedience, it proves what God will do. So does it say anything to us? What does it say to us? If we are obedient, God will do some great and mighty things. You know, I'm not bashful about asking God. God, now I'm, I want you to do something right now. And Lord, I need you to do something I can't do. I told you what uh, Pastor Tony Evans says it like this. A blessing is when God allows you to get something and use your strength to do something. God has blessed me to come here today. But a miracle is when we get to a point, regardless of how holy we are, we cannot accomplish it. So God has to step in and make it. The difference in the blessing is that God uses our obedience to get us blessed. 
But the difference in the blessing and the miracle is God defiles all of his laws and you still are miraculously blessed. Isn't that amazing? God defiled his own law to get you blessed. God says what goes up must come down because of gravity. And if you want to see a human form of it, in, in Brother Miles' day, in Brother, Brother Taylor's day, if you want to see a human form of it, Dr. J would just hang in there. Just hang there. He was one of the first ones to start at, at half court, get about between half court and the key, and just hang in there. Am I right? Now young people, and brother, brother, brother Whitlock's day, Michael Jordan just hangs in there. You see the difference? I mean, these guys defile gravity. And check this out. It wasn't even for God's glory. It was for their glory. But when God does a miracle, he does it without the laws that he has put in place. He does something that the doctor can't do. He does something that the judge cannot put in place. How many of y'all have ever been to court? Not, not for your own case, nobody else's case. Okay? <laughs> How many of y'all have been to court and you know he was gone for 25 years? Mm -hmm. yeah. But all of a sudden, the jury says the glove doesn't fit, so you have to acquit. So we have to get to a point in our lives where we understand that God and God alone can do some miracles. When you look at Elijah on Mount Carmel, you will see the fact that God and God alone can lick water up out of the trenches. God and God alone can burn up an altar that's soaking wet with water. Nobody can do it but God. You can't even light wet wood, but God can. It's a miracle from the Almighty God. Number six, A, what would be the difference between the quality of service and the quantity of lasting results when God is working and when God, when you are working. What is the difference between what you get done and what God gets done? Is there a difference? Is there a difference? Do you think Elijah was, was confident in his God? Do you think the people, the 850 prophets were confident in their God? Yes? They were pretty confident, weren't they? Or did they look at the numbers? It's 850 us to one. We know our God don't come. And sometimes we get to that point even in our churches. We believe if we get the whole congregation to pray on one thing, God will do some things, right? And we ought to have corporate prayer. We have seen at the New Beginning Church where God does things when we all get together in corporate prayer. And they were thinking the same way about the God. But guess what? They were up against the true and the living God. B, what are you doing in your life personally and in your church that you know cannot be accomplished unless God, is to, God does it? Somebody talk to me. What are you doing in your life personally? What are you doing in your life and in the church, in the life of your church that you know that if it's going to be done, if it's going to take place, God's going to do it? Anybody? Who's raising their hand? Who's taking their mask off? Who's talking? Anybody? For myself, uh, with my illness, I know that God brought me through and gave me more strength to continue on. Okay. Uh, and I'm still in that faith, but I'm not as bad. Something greater for me. In our health, there. in our health, the, the doctor can't do it. In our health, 
There are some challenges that we just can't get through. And we've taken all the medication, we've done all the exercise, we've gotten all the sleep, we quoted all the scripture, we fasted, we prayed, and there are some things that's going to happen in our lives that only God can do it. That's why we keep calling on him. you got to keep calling on God. Keep telling him about it. And I, I'm a proponent to take it to the Lord and leave it there, but while it's there, Lord, I'm going to remind you that it's sitting there. Anybody else in this house like that? And I'm going to remind God of what he promised. I'm going to remind God of what God has said. Now, God, you said in your word, if I'm obedient unto you, you will do A, B, and C. And now, God, while you're doing A, B, and C, let me put something in there that gives you D. It's the kind of fellowship you ought to have with God. It is called kononia. So, there are some things in our lives, whether you admit tonight or not, there are some things in your life that you want to accomplish and you know that they're not going to take place unless God does it. There are some attitudes that we can have even in the local church and even the person with the attitude knows, God, if this is going to be fixed, you got to fix it. I'll try to fix it. There are some mouths there are some mouths that try, that you tried to control. And you've already told God, God, if this mouth going to be closed, you're going to have to close it. Whether it's your mouth or somebody else's mouth. See, what are you doing in your life and in your church that can be done without God's involvement? Hmm. What can you do in your life? <laughs> in your church. Sister Bernie, what can you do in your life and in your church? And you have told God, God, I got this one. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> Hang out over here for a while, God. I, I got this one covered. Anybody? Sister Bernie doesn't want to tell us today, y'all. But, uh, the reason why I know that some people have come to the conclusion, God, I got this, is because of how they act in the midst of. How many of you saw the preacher that almost got shot in the middle of a sermon, in the pistol jam? Did the preacher do it? Did the gun mess up? The pastor said, God jammed the gun. <laughs> and can I just have a confession tonight? Can we just confess tonight? Can I just confess tonight? When I saw it, Brother Miles, and they wrestled the brother down, I said, I would have had to whoop him good. <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on now. I mean, he pulled the trigger. The trigger, the, the bullet, the bullet got stuck. The gun jammed, and that you know that church is full of Christians. The deacon sacrificed his life. I don't care if he does have his back turned. He sacrificed his life for himself, his pastor, and the whole congregation. And then the pastor ran over and grabbed him and wrestled the gun from him, but I had, I had to hit him one time in his chop. I mean, <laughs> Brother Johnson, I, I would have to lay one on one on more. And it wouldn't have been no pity patty. either. So am I, you know, y'all don't send, send me to hell tonight here. But I, I would have to lay a couple on him right there. On the, I mean, with the cameras rolling, people do stuff when cameras rolling, right? I could have been justified too. But I know y'all so holy, y'all would have done it just like he did it. Y'all would have just wrestled him to the ground, took the pistol from him, let him sit there till the laws got there. I, I ain't as holy as you are. <laughs> Sister Brown, I would have to shut his lights out right there on the spot. I would have to turn it, turn it. I would have to, I have to have his, his heels turned up toward heaven. I, I, I would have to, <laughs> oh, mama, forgive me, please. D, why do you think you experience meager fruit 
that does not lie. Woo, good God Almighty. Why do you experience little bitty meager fruit that does not last? Who's talking? Some people look like they want to talk. Why? Okay, not, not why you. Okay, why do other people experience meager fruit? I think I can get an answer there. Why do individuals refer, refer, re, receive or experience Small blessings. Because they plant small seeds. Ooh, good God Almighty. Because their walk is not good. Because they're not walking in obedience. And because they plant small seeds. Now, break that down. That's a, that's a big, that's a holy word there. Now, tell me about these seeds. What does that mean? They plant small seeds. It's high, What you say? Hey, give her that microphone, please. Where's that microphone? <laughs> so they plant small seeds. What, what are we talking about? Plants. Come on, talk to me. Tithing is a is a part of being obedient. Okay. Uh, Tithing is is a part of so being you obedient. Have your, you have to do your. You have to give your ten percent. Then you don't stop there. You should give love gifts. You should. Help people that's in need. You have to you have help me. each other. Yeah. Amen. You Stop know, it. so Stop it. of course we don't like to put our windows down all the time for panhandlers, but mm -hmm. sometimes God has to give that person ten dollars. You put that one in here yeah, ten dollars. Okay. You know, we just have to but time so is very important. As we plant seeds, we get a fruit. Oh, we get an increase. Yes, because you can't grow anything if you don't plant the seed. Amen. So it's Davis Davis. She's behind you. Tell us about this walk. We we talking about a walk. Talking about a walk. Talking about a walk. Well, we have to follow the Lord and stay close to him, just like we were saying a couple days ago about us pulling ourselves away from him instead of him pulling himself away from us. Mm -hmm. We have to strive to do better and to pur purposely do things and study more and Stay in the word so that. Um, so we have to be intentional about it, right? We have to be intentional. We have to intentionally do some things that that keeps us in the will of God. Yeah, we have to be intentional. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't take place. We got to be intentionally walking with God, intentionally doing things to make sacrifices unto Him. We have to be intentional about it. You have to be intentional. And you have to be intentional about the sacrifices you make unto the Lord. I would hate to go into don't just do something if we're not there. Are there any questions or comments about tonight's lesson? Any questions or comments about what we have covered tonight? Who has don't just do something? Who has that for next week? We're going to do that one next week. And, and I want to tell you now, don't just do something, stand there. The world says, don't just stand there, do something. Next week, we're going to talk about don't just do something, stand there. So Sister Davis Davis is going to take us all the way to number eight next week. And so we want to make sure that we are clear. God does miraculous works through obedience. When we talk about obedience, what, what are we talking about being obedient to, or who are we talking about being obedient to? I know that's terrible English. I end the question with a, a, a preposition. I'm sorry. To, to whom are we talking about being obedient? God and his word. God and his word. Um, why do we need to be obedient? It keeps us safe. It keeps us safe. What do you mean safe? It keeps us, if you lie with God, you're pretty much safe. If you align yourself with God, you're, you're safe. You're safe. He covers you. The pastor said, God jammed the gun. He, he said he jammed the gun. The guy said the demons told him to kill the pastor. Mm. And then he says, God told him to kill the pastor. Mm. But I know God would have told me to lay a few on him. Well, I just know. <laughs> I just know God would have been talking to me on that one. See, because you all, you all don't know. 
realistically what that looks like. I know realistically what that looks like, what it feels like, and I know what it means to wait on the bullet to be fired. I'm standing at Johnny Mac's store in Indianola, Mississippi, getting ready to pump some gas. Guys jump out the car, one of them put a gun up to my head and say, I'm going to kill you in some other words. And he pulled the trigger and the gun didn't fire. I'm going to tell you, it's a, it, it's a hard thing. I was so mad I had moved to Houston, had been in Houston 10 years, and I went back to church, and that boy was standing up there with his good top in church. I wanted to lay a few on him right then and there in the church. But he came to me and apologized. I'm going to tell you, God damn the gun. God did it. And he, he was singing in a quartet when I went back home. I'm just sitting there waiting on the musical to start on the front row. I'm just sitting there passing my, patting my feet to the music. And he walks off the stage and shakes my hand and said, man, I'm sorry. I found out it wasn't you. Y'all may not know what it feels like. <laughs> but it's a terrible situation to be in. You're just waiting on the the sound. You can't run, you can't fight, you can't move because the bullet is faster than you are. But I'm here to tell you tonight, God jammed the bullet. God jammed the gun. God stopped the bullet. And I live today to stand here and tell you the story of what God has done. That would have been the death of an innocent man. Some 10 years later, he's going to tell me, I found out it wasn't you. I wanted to lay two of them on him right then and there. But God, jam my hand. God, God held me. And that's what God does. He, I'm telling you, it was a miracle. And God, didn't he do it? Won't he do it? Has he done it? Will you, will, you, will you try? He'll do it every time. And let me tell you something. That wasn't a mechanical failure. Either. That was God. 16, 17 years old, that was God. God did it. So I knew what that pastor was going through right then and there. He was slowly getting back over there to, to rouse him down. I would have dove on. God has a way of blessing us. And check this out. God knows who to put to the test. And that pastor did something that all of us should grow to be able to do. And say, I forgive you. I love you. God bless you. That's what Jesus did. He died for you and for me. They killed him. It was the death of an innocent man. He died on Calvary. But he rose from the dead just for you. And if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment, and you don't have to be super spiritual. Just believe the story that over 2,000 years ago on the Skull Hill called Calvary, Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a barber tomb, and he rose from the dead. Jesus is our Savior. He is our Lord. He's our protector. And if you have not received him into your life, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. Would you just bow your head with me and invite him into your heart? It only takes one time, and he will ask you to come in. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. 
thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer now, you are born again. You're on your way to heaven. And whenever you leave planet Earth, you're on your way to heaven. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. If you want to give to our ministry, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. For those of you who are in the room, if you need an envelope, raise your hand and you will be served. It is offering time. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We thank you for all that you have done. We ask you to bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests. Praise reports or prayer requests. Amen. So next week we're going to talk about don't just do something. Just stand there. Who has that one? Who has that one? Sister Davis. Davis is going to open it up for us. Please start reading day four. Please start reading day four. Day four is relatively short. Please start reading day four. Day four is God works through his servants. God works through his servants. So close out day three and start reading day four. Amen. Texas, each of Texas, our evangelism explosion. I'll be presenting Good News on the Go, sharing the gospel, Good News on the Go. It's in Egypt, Texas, straight down 59 South, population 42. Population 42. So, uh, and I will be ministering to about 55 people. Population 42. God is going to bless me to minister to about 55 people. God is such an awesome God. I thought about when we retired, we would move to Eden, Texas. <laughs> move out to Eden, Texas. I want to see, see if we move to Egypt, Texas so we can make population 44. So on the 18th of May, I'll be ministering in Egypt, Texas, talking about sharing the gospel, good news, good news on the go. Amen? Amen. All minds clear? Our hearts clear, let us stand to be dismissed. Somebody that's saying amen every time I make a word. Amen. Let's go to God. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us to come again. Lord, we ask you to bless us to be obedient. Lord, we ask you to do great miracles in our presence and for us. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling 
Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, join us by saying, Amen. Amen. Just for me.